my name is Liam Russell, and today I'll be presenting my physics SI. The quantum behavior of light has been observed since the origin of modern optics, but until recent years has not been easily accessible in an undergraduate lab setting. As the equipment required for this type of work has become more affordable in recent years, the Augustana Physics Department was able to support our putting together of some really cool quantum optics experiments this year. Uh, this project outlines a design for one such experiment, which focuses on single photon interference from an entangled source. Jumping into background information as an optical experiment, we'll first have to talk about light and some of its properties. Um, so light is an electromagnetic wave, and polarization is related to the electric field direction of a given light source. Um, so if all of the light from a source has the same electric field direction, that light is said to be polarized in that direction. Um, this is linear polarization, um, which is the most simple version of polarization, is what we're dealing with here, um, and it's often described by an angle from the vertical direction. Um, polarization is a state, which is a word I will probably be saying quite a bit, and a state just describes a certain property of matter with mathematical expressions. In quantum mechanics, the math related to a state generally gives information about the probability that a particle will be in that state given certain environmental factors. Another important vocab word I'd like to throw out now is superposition, um, which describes the fact that any linear combination of valid states is itself a valid state. So this is really nice for making our math easier, since we can represent states in whatever way makes the most sense for our coordinate system. Um, so for example, a 45 degree polarization angle um, is mathematically equivalent to a superposition between a vertical and a horizontal polarization direction, um, which we're going to be using several times throughout the course of this experimental design. I also wanted to give a brief definition of entanglement right now since that's uh, something we'll be looking at shortly. Uh, and for our purposes, we'll consider two photons entangled if their states cannot be completely described independently of one another. Um, so the photons have this intrinsic link to one another and measurements of their states will reflect that. With that background information in mind, let's jump into the theory of single photon interference. Our goal is to determine if entangled photons interfere with themselves in the same way that non-entangled photons do. So to answer this question, we'll be using a Moxander interferometer. At the entrance of the interferometer, there's a polarizing beam splitter. And if input light is in a superposition of vertical and horizontal polarization states, um, then the beam splitter will result in one vertical polarization arm and one horizontal polarization arm. Placing a properly oriented half wave plate, which is just an optic that changes from one linear polarization to another, then flips the horizontal path to vertical. Uh, note that the experiment would be equally valid if we flipped the vertical arm. Instead, our choice was just arbitrary. So then light in both arms proceeds to bounce off of their respective mirrors, only one of which is movable. And this movable mirror is what makes the two arms slightly different lengths, and that allows for interference to happen. In classical wave mechanics, um, if you have two light sources that are out of phase by integer multiples of half a wavelength, um, then there will be a net destructive addition of the waves that then leads to zero or very low intensity light at that point. Um, the opposite is also true where if two maximums line up, so that would be an offset of integer multiples of a full wavelength, um, then we'll see a maximum intensity at that point. Something important to note here, though, is that unlike continuous sources of light, interference has to do with the likelihood of detection as opposed to intensity. So interference influences the actual existence of a photon. If no photons are detected at a given mirror distance, then destructive interference is being observed, um, and constructive interference will result in a relative maximum number of detections per time. The paths then recombine at the second beam splitter, and this eliminates path labeling information since a quirk of quantum mechanics is that taking a measurement can eliminate some of the entangled behavior that we're trying to observe. So from there, we can use matrix formalisms and state manipulation from quantum mechanics, um, and we can mathematically model the way a single photon would behave in an interferometer setup like this one. Um, the result should be vaguely sinusoidal in nature, as shown here in figure one. And then this sort of brings it back to our guiding question, would an entangled photon interfere with itself in the same way that a non-entangled photon would, or is its ability to interfere with itself hindered by its entangled partner? Tying this all together, we'll move into the experimental design portion of the project. We start with a near-UV pump laser that's shot through a double BBO crystal, undergoing spontaneous parametric down conversion. Um, and that's a much more complicated process that I'm going to get into. All we really need to know is that it ends up uh, giving us polarization and tangled pairs of photons. Um, so those generated photons are gathered by two collimated lenses that are connected to fiber optic cables, and the fiber optic cables lead to our detectors. Um, and what we're looking for here is coincidence counts from the detectors, which is when they both go off at the same time indicating the presence of a photon. 
Um, so since the detectors are equidistant from the pump laser, coincidence counts will also mean entangled pair production. Uh, and then we can further optimize our physical alignment from there to get maximum amount of correlated counts possible for our setup. Once entangled pair production is confirmed, one of the fibers can be led into an interferometer instead of straight into the detector. And then data collection is similar to the non-entangled version I discussed earlier, um, but rather than individual photon detection, we're again looking for joint detection. The entangled partner goes down a length of fiber equal to the length of the interferometer so that we can still use this as a, an adequate measure for entanglement. From there, we can analyze our data um, and figure out what our probability functions will look like as compared to the non-entangled version of the experiment. So to briefly summarize and look forward, right now in the lab, entangled pair confirmation is underway, but still in the alignment phase. We're hopeful that we'll be able to finish at least part one of the design uh, by the end of the semester so that future students can pick up with part two. Possible future experiments include quantum eraser and a Hambury brown twist test, both of which are appropriate for undergraduate level quantum and use very similar setups to this design. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my presentation, and if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in a the comment below. I'll try my best to get back to everybody. Thank you so much.